I, I want to thank you for coming. It's Friday night. You have plenty of other things to do. Obviously, it is a sign that you are concerned about where the country is at and where we are heading. Uh, it also is a sign of due respect that all of us are paying to Stephen and to Shane um, because there, you can't imagine any more probing type of politicians in the Doyle today. There's very few of them. Um, it is not my job to tell you how you should vote. In fact, any pundit or any an analyst who says how you should vote, you being collectively the voters, um, in my view is doing disservice to the job of doing analysis and performing analysis. I'll give you a few facts and my understanding of some of the main issues relating to the treaty. And I'll start from the top in terms of where do I think we need to be and does the treaty deliver on where we need to be. So most of us in economics profession agree that Eurozone, the common currency area, the monetary union, requires new fiscal policy architecture. It is usually coached into the whole issue of the federalization of fiscal policy, convergence of fiscal policy, harmonization of fiscal policy, whichever way you say it, we need serious fiscal policy coordination and also some sort of the convergence. You can't run the monetary policy without having a coordination of the fiscal policies because the two form the sides to the economy. An economy cannot be unbalanced. And there's a very big issue with an issue of balance overall in terms of policies and the particular policy solutions that the European Union is putting forward, including in the fiscal pact. <laughs> we do need fiscal discipline, continuing borrowing when the number of countries in the European Union are now in excess of 90% and some are in excess of 110% of debt to GDP ratios, you know that this is not sustainable. It is not sustainable for younger population Ireland, but it also is not sustainable even more for the likes of Italy, where the debt to GDP ratio is in excess of 120%, population is nearly shrinking, almost shrinking. Even German debts themselves are not sustainable because German population is shrinking. They are getting older and older and older, meaning their productive capacity is declining in their economy. And as your productive capacity declines, who's going to pay increase in demand for pensions? It's a very big problem. We never talk about pensions as well, even in this country. Which this is what we call uh, unfunded liabilities. We don't factor them into the debt as if they don't exist. But of course, they will materialize, and we don't think about that. But what we need as far as fiscal discipline is critically properly structured fiscal discipline just to slap some sort of the target, say 60% or 70% for the debt or 80% for the debt. And by the way, why is it 60%? I have no idea. I'm an economist. I can tell you nothing tells me that something should be 60%. What I can tell you is that the research internationally shows that for the advanced economies, the developed economies, like Ireland, like Germany, like France, for government debt, the damage, level, the damage barrier at which and beyond which accumulation of that government debt starts to damage economic growth in the future is about 80 to 85 percent. So it's not 60. Okay? So there's a big question there. Why is it 60? Um, 3 percent deficit, fine. That can be understood within the context of shallow growth rates in Europe that are expected into the future and a relatively shallow inflation environment that the ECB is targeting. So fair play. What we need are effective and efficient economically fiscal rules, the ones which actually have meaning. And meaning not in terms of pain they impose, but actually the positive outcome. We all are here consumers and investors. In our life, we all are accustomed to making, not maybe painful, but uncomfortable decisions. Yes, a decision of postponing joy today by buying a new car and instead investing in the future, yes, for our family and for ourselves. That's a painful decision. It is motivated by a payoff in the future, not by the amount of pain that we have to sustain today. The fiscal compa compact, unfortunately, really doesn't hold much of a promise in terms of the future. There is no promise of the future. It doesn't say that in the future growth will be high because you achieved through that pain you take up front this, this, and this, and this. It says that, the, you know, well, it doesn't say actually, but some politicians around it, including 
the ruling coalition in this country say things like, well, it will prevent future crisis. But as Stephen correctly pointed out, it won't. It has nothing to do with future crisis because it doesn't address even the causes of the crisis that we're experiencing today, let alone anticipates, foresees, and pre-prices in terms of the response required, the crisis that might arise in the future. We also need a treaty which, or set of rules which are enforceable. There is no point of passing something which cannot be enforced, yes? Because all you're doing is you're setting yourself up for the future realization by the market participants that you basically told Porky to the rest of the world. And it ain't going to go really nicely. We've seen that happening, yes? When Greece told a bit of a Porky, I mean, where they are now? In a bit of a ditch. That's what happens when you fool the markets. You can fool them once, you can fool them twice, you can fool them for several months, maybe even years. So now later the blowout happens. Reality meets, and that's it. So you need an enforceable set of rules. But in addition, beyond that, the fiscal rules are not just the rules of fiscal policies, are not just the rules about how much you cannot spend, okay, or how much you cannot borrow. They are much more complicated than that. What Europe and Eurozone needs is risk sharing mechanism. What the hell does it mean? Well, it means that there should be an automatic, if we're putting together automatic rules in terms of putting the brakes on how much we can borrow and spend and all the likes, in terms of the deficit, for example, and debt to GDP ratios, like the fiscal treaty is suggesting, we also need to put in place some sort of an automatic, not a discretionary, automatic mechanism for what happens when the country runs into trouble. Okay. Stephen mentioned there this panacea called ESM. Alas, ESM, while tangentially linked through the blackmail clause to the fiscal treaty, is not in the fiscal treaty. Voting on the fiscal treaty, you will not be voting on ESM. ESM is a separate entirely undertaking, and the doll is going to vote on ESM separately after the referendum on the fiscal treaty. What is ESM? ESM is a debt mechanism. It's in effect a mechanism whereby the less indebted countries will underwrite debt for more debt for the more indebted countries. So in effect, the ESM is a promise to cure the problem of debt, too much debt, with piling in more debt. Now, all of us run households. You have to have a lot of pints before you actually arrive at this being a plausible conclusion to any problem in a household. <laughs> now, I listened to Stephen very carefully on this point, and I accept his argument, and I recognize his argument and the importance of the argument that, yes, the blackmail clause effectively at least promises to prevent us and I'm not a legal scholar, so I can't really tell whether it really does or not, but let's assume it does prevent us from participating in ESM. However, there is also a question we should ask ourselves as to whether the participation in ESM in the first place is going to deliver us that panacea of a solution or resolution of our current predicament. Again, don't take me wrong. I'm not saying that it will. It, I'm not saying it won't, but I can say pretty much with some sort of certainty or a little bit of a conviction there that once we're in the ESM, all of the debts that we currently face as the government, quasi-governmental debts such as NAMA, and all of the associated debts through the guarantees, through the bank resolution system that we have inherited, will be repayable. There will be no renegotiating any single cent of those debts once we put them into ESM. Why? because that is unimaginable. It is unimaginable from the point of view that once the Irish debts get, conver get converted into ESM, any write down on those debts after that conversion will automatically signify a default on ESM and default within the ESM system. If you think about ESM being set up as the answer to all problems across Europe, that will in effect signify Europe defaulting on itself. That will never be allowed. So I believe, in my view, 
and it's not obviously 100%, but in my view, in my belief is that once we're in ASM, the debt deflation will continue. It might ease off a little bit on the interest rate. That is true, will give us a little bit of a breathing space in a short time. But all of the debts that we will convert into ESM will become automatically what I would call super senior. In other words, they will hold seniority on repayment higher than anyone else short of IMF. Because, well, it might be even equivalent to IMF. I don't know that yet, okay. That's something to think about. Um, what else is there? Um, well, ESM, by the way, is not automatic. Just because we qualify for ESM doesn't mean that ESM is going to give us a check. There is nothing there, as far as I understand, that automatically says that Ireland requires funding on the basis of this and these conditions, and therefore Ireland automatically gets the funding. No. Somebody in the ESM will have to approve that funding. I don't know how it's going to be done, but again, that puts the question mark over is the link between the ESM and the fiscal treaty is a link to the salvation of Ireland. I'm not so sure. What else is there? At any rate, do remember, ESM is not in the current treaty. Voting on the current treaty, yes, means, doesn't mean that we are going to get the funding from ESM. And it doesn't mean what amount of funding and under what conditions we're going to get from ESM. Voting no does appear to me to mean that we will not get the funding from ESM. So there is a balance for you to decide. But hold on a second. I just finished only with fiscal policies that are not in the treaty and yet should be in the treaty if we were to put the treaty on board. Yes? There is a second one set, and that's the monetary policy. Well, once we suppose solve the problem of fiscal policies, doing all of that the treaty entails plus more, we still will have a problem on monetary policy side. Why? Because we will tie our hands, not fully, a little bit maneuver will be allowed, I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but we will tie our hands significantly on the fiscal side. That means that any sort of the growth response, shock response, any sort of the recessionary responses in the future will have to be primarily driven through monetary policy because there is nothing else in economics to drive it through. Alas, our monetary policy is driven by the European Central Bank for whom consideration of growth or unemployment is not figuring anywhere in a mandate. It actually is neither required nor even allowed to target any of those parameters. Therefore, fixing the fiscal side with proper good rules still requires fixing the monetary side and the debate about that and discussion about that haven't even started. There is no equivalent treaty or mechanism which would compel or change the mandate of the European Central Bank to target growth, for example, like the, uh, like the Fed, or co-target growth together with other things as well, okay? Now, again, this is not delivered by the current treaty as well. The problem again is if you go back, so let me summarize the main points there of what I've said. In my view, from just hard analysis from fiscal side, the fiscal com compact itself is useless as the means for either dealing with the current crisis, because the current crisis is that of debt, and the fiscal compact doesn't deal with that, and it's not only doesn't deal with debt, even though it sets the target for debt, but it doesn't provide the mechanism how you're going to draw it down. We're insolvent. How the hell are we going to pay down the debt according to the fiscal rules? It's just like walking into the household who is defaulting on a mortgage and telling them, you know what, you have to pay that down. That's your path. That's your future. You're going to have to pay it down. And the householder says, you know, sorry, I don't have any money. Yes? No, no, that, that, that's not the point. There is a mechanism. Yes, and the mechanism says you pay monthly your mortgage. Okay. Hell, what does the household do with the mechanism? Throws out of the window because it can't afford it anyways. Okay? The second issue is that it doesn't prevent future crisis because as Stephen correctly pointed it out, it doesn't do anything. We were stellar performers. There is even more fun in the bloody fiscal treaty, yes? The fun of it is that in one of the metrics, in a structural deficit metric in particular, judging by one set of parameters, we satisfied structural deficit requirement throughout the entire period of 2000 through 2006. By another one, we did not satisfy it in any year between the 2000 and 2006. That's the reality of what we call 
a hard metric to which we are tying our government policy. There is no real metric. It's not really properly defined. You put five economists around and they might produce three between themselves definitions of what the structural deficit should look like. <laughs> and when you ask them to estimate, they will produce probably 15 estimates. Because for each economist, there will be at least three. Yeah. Upper range, lower range, and the middle range. <laughs> IMF does it. If you look at the past forecasts of the IMF, and I, you know, and I did that, you know, the range of the estimates that they are providing is absolutely staggeringly wide in terms of the deficits. We can talk about that during the questions, you know, because people would ask, I'm sure, about that as well. Okay. Uh, there are ambiguities, as I said, in the fiscal treaty. Again, as I said, IMF Ireland largely has been within satisfying the 0.5 parameter that the fiscal treaty is inducing. EU pretty much primarily showing that the EU, EU estimate that we do not satisfy. Current adjustment is very significant, 5.5% structural <laughs> deficit estimated currently in Ireland. Yes, so the target, if you are to reduce it to 5%, would entail a correction of 7.5 billion. Now, we have a bit of a problem with collecting a couple hundred million under the household charge. 7.5 seven and a half billion, where are they going to get it from? I mean, start selling counties. You're not going to get to it, you know, until you pretty much end up somewhere near Bray, you know, and then the rest of Dublin, and maybe that's it, you know. Um, there is ambiguity of forecasts themselves. We tie in things, we tie in hands for the government with the rules, which are very prescriptive, very precise rules. These are not kind of rules where there is a gray area, room to maneuver. No, 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 no. These are precise targets, 0.5%, 3%, 0.5%, 60%. 120 rule to 60%. This is it. You notice it's not 1 tenth to 1 twentieth, 1 twentieth to 1 fiftieth. No, no, 1 twentieth. Done. Okay, so what do we do then? Okay, let's look at the IMF, and this is one of the most accurate forecasters in the world, forecasts for GDP for Ireland. Not just forecasts, but also past reporting. So let's say they're reporting today for 2001. And then also there are estimates. For example, today they estimate what our GDP was in 2010. They don't know exactly. In 2011, estimates of GDP provided by IMF over the range of five years through 2011 range between 4% and 0.5% growth. So under some assumptions before, at certain years, they were predicting that our growth will be 4% in 2011. Under other assumptions in different years, they were predicting it was 0.5% every year. How do you tie to that a specific rule? It changes all of the time. This is not a precise science. Okay, you will say, that's 2011, that's crisis, things really are volatile. Okay, let's look at 2005, the same range of forecasts for the same years, 4.8% to 6% growth. Much narrower, of course, because they are forecasting less forward and also because the economy is moving. But still, 1.2% difference. 1.2% difference today for us physically now, materially, in Ireland would mean that we would be in the expansion rather than in the recession. That's significant damn difference, isn't it? Ambiguity is all over around economics. This is why in macroeconomics there are two really approaches and two schools, very large school and very small school. Very small school says that there should be rules-based macroeconomics. In other words, macroeconomic decisions by the governments, regulators, central banks should be driven by rules. Rules can describe absolutely everything. Taken to ad infinitum, to absurdity, this argument means that humanity can be run as a software program, okay? That's technocracy that you mentioned. It scares pants off me, and I am a macroeconomist. Why? Because I know that humanity is the last thing which can be governed by any sort of algorithm. Because we are all moody, random, highly unpredictable, behaviorally bizarre, strange creatures. That's what makes the world beautiful. <laughs> I am. Hey. So anyways, but at the same time, I do recognize, as a macroeconomist, I recognize you need to tie a little bit the hands of the governments, primarily so that the current government can't really front load into the future the liabilities on which it lives today. In other words, it can't really feed its own cronies at the expense of future generations. Okay? You do want to have some. Okay? 
So how do you do that? P probably most of my colleagues, I would say, agree that to some extent, you need to have a macroeconomic framework which has three major components to it, or it does three major things, and does it simultaneously, and does it well, and does it transparently. First of all, public deficits and debts should be allowed to some extent to act as buffers against the shocks in the future, okay? So in other words, that's what they are for. You should be able to accumulate a little bit more debt to offset a recession. You should be able to run a deeper deficit during the, when the times are heading into high unemployment and things like that as well. And I'm not a Keynesian, but I still recognize pragmatically that you should be able to do that. There is a buffer in effect that macroeconomic policies put together. The second one is that the long-term policy should discourage unsustainable accumulation of debt into the future over the long period of time. And the third one is something that's probably a little bit more controversial for my colleagues, and a lot of them actually ignore it, but I think it's very important. The fiscal policy should recognize the existence of automatic stabilizers and destabilizers in the economy. What the hell did I just say? No, it's not a prescription for hair loss. It is something that Stephen was referred to. It's the source of our fiscal problems today. One of our biggest problems, apart from banks, okay, and apart from private debt, one of our biggest problems is that when the crisis hit, the past spending patterns, past expenditure decisions by the exchequer came to haunt us. We hiked up the social welfare, up, 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 and up, because we could afford it when there were few social welfare recipients. When that went up, we are bust. We hiked up pensions in the public sector, up, 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 because there were few pensioners in the public sector, and because we could afford it, because the property market was booming. When that went bust, the whole thing just went straight exponentially up as relative to our ability to pay for it, and on and on and on. Good sometimes well des desired, if you want, or well motivated policies of helping the poor, helping the elderly, or things like that, can result if they are not properly clawed back at, you know, or you don't have a capacity to claw them back out, can result in unsustainable accumulation of the expenditure in, in the time when you are in a crisis. That's the automatic destabilizers. Good fiscal policy should address that possibility. It should prevent the governments from making decisions for a quick fix to, if you want to appease the interest group to gain their vote or to gain their approval or to shut them up or whatever else to do, when that can, can result in the future in the unsustainable risk to the exchequer. So the conclusion, therefore, when I look at the fiscal compact, what does it do vis-a-vis -vis those three desired, in my view, policies? Well, in, first, in the first policy, it doesn't really severely restrict fiscal deficits. Actually, it doesn't. It restricts on the upside, like very heavy deficits, but it does allow for some deficit financing. That, by the way, is true, okay? Now, by our current metric, it wouldn't allow what we're doing today, but it would allow some room for maneuver. So it ties the hands, ties them a little bit, maybe too tight on the deficit side, but not too bad. The second one is it restricts public debt accumulation in the future, and quite severely so. Now that might be a good thing or might be a bad thing, depends where you come from. In my view, it probably is on the net a better thing. Now, but don't take my argument there. That is my view, not the factual thing. Factually, it does restrict it quite severely. Okay, so for example, under our current conditions of growth, we are heading into somewhere like 25% to GDP ratio of debt. That's very low debt. I would like to see Ireland in a situation of 25% debt to GP, GDP ratio anytime. I would love to. Why? Because it's so obviously then solvent and debt free. But the problem is, how are we going to get to it from 112% that we're at today? I mean, we don't have a non-benevolent venal dictator with large armies standing behind who can impose that type of resolution onto us. 120 rule is just going to seal that misery of adjustment towards that debt for not just one decade or two decades or three decades, longer than that. This is a really big problem. Setting the right target doesn't mean that you have a path by which you will achieve it. And again, fiscal compact doesn't deliver on that. 
Fiscal compact does not address in any way, shape, or form the, if you want, ignorance of the composition of fiscal expenditure. That's the third point I was making, yes, about the automatic destabilizers, but it also goes broader. Keynes, for example, favored very strongly capital expenditure over current expenditure, yes? In other words, he favored investment in, by the government in the economy over just simply creating jobs. Now, he also said, of course, that, yeah, creating jobs if you can't do anything else is good. And I'm not Keynesian, by the way. I actually would, wouldn't be sharing his view there, but a lot of people here would be. Okay? Fiscal compact doesn't really address the issue of investment. It doesn't deal with an issue of in investment versus current expenditure. It just says all expenditure, chop, 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 chop. That is a very big problem for me as well. I'll stop at that stage, and I'll just reiterate very briefly. There are a couple of myths that we are hearing, and this is literally just very quick statements. We can discuss them in questions as well, and I'm sure people from the Twitter will be asking as well, and from the... Um, is it politics.ie or boards.ie? <coughs> politics.ie will be asking about that as well. Um, there is a major, two major myths. One of them is fiscal compact, in effect, will prevent the Keynesian policies to be deployed in Eurozone. That is not true. As I said before, it limits the scope of Keynesian policies. It limits it strongly in the long run on the debt side and less strongly and, you know, and less strongly limits on the deficit side. But it doesn't prevent the governments from deficit financing. It just restricts the extent of deficit financing, which can be good. The second one is the fiscal compact, some people argue, is very strict in terms of the debt rules that it imposes in the short run. Because of 120 rule, it actually is not that strict on that side. Okay, because your adjustment path to the target of 60 is very shallow, very slow, very prolonged. Okay? That is both good thing and bad thing. It's good thing on the side that you don't have a huge shock that you have to repay all of the debt or large chunk of the debt in a very short compressed period of time. But it is also the bad thing because once your debt exerts the drag on your economic growth, which happens according to Cicchetti, Zampoli, and Mohani, uh, research from the Bank for International Settlements, for example, around 83% of the GDP ratio, that the GDP ratio on the government side, yes? You're going to have a very hell of a long, of a long period of time when that drug is going to be exerted because your debt is going to stay above 83% for a very long period of time. This is why, really, the third point is what Stephen raised there about the ESM comes to play. What is the most optimal way and path for Ireland out of the crisis today? And it is not through the fiscal compact, in my view. The most optimal way is to deal with an issue of unsustainable debts, total debts in the economy. The only way to deal with it, and we cannot imagine dealing through it by defaulting on government debt, that should not happen, in my view, and we should avoid it by any possible means, then we are left with only one, and only one possible solution, dealing with a household debt. So, if in a way, the government of Ireland, in my view, wanted to structure the relationship of relative to the fiscal treaty, its position relative to the fiscal treaty, in a way that will both enable the fiscal treaty to be effective in the future in terms of being a good set of policies conducive to reforms in the long run and conducive to st stability and sustainability in the long run, at the same time while allowing Ireland to get out of the current crisis, it would turn around and it would say to our partners, you allow us to write down banks' debts and with it write down the household debts and we will in turn sign up to the fiscal treaty. Thank you very much. We're still going to borrow 50 billion euros just to manage the budget deficit. And we're borrowing it from our children. Yes, I saw that the US Chamber of Commerce press conference today and they made a very political statement and a very significant statement.